Welcome to the Smart Money Tribe podcast. I'm your host, Arisa. I'm the founder of smartmoneyafrica.org, a financial education platform tailored to the African millennial woman. But I'm probably best known as the author of two best-selling personal finance books, The Smart Money Woman and The Smart Money Tribe. I love having money conversations that encourage African women to think bigger and become the chief financial officers of their own personal economies. This podcast is a weekly show that will focus on powerful conversations, stories, and practical lessons that teach African millennial women how to make money, keep money, and grow money. Hi, potties. So 2021 is in full swing, and I'm super excited about my goals still. Thank God. Just taking it one step at a time this year. It's so funny. I saw something on Instagram that said 2021 is just 2020 wearing a wig. (laughs) And I thought it was so funny, but I really hope that this year is going to be so much better than last year was and that we're just going to learn the lessons that we're supposed to learn and apply them this year. So my next guest is a super impressive lady called Maya Hogan Famodou. She's a Nigerian-American entrepreneur, founder, and partner at Ingressive. And Ingressive is the firm that provides market entry, technology research, and market operations services for firms and businesses expanding into Africa. She also founded Ingressive Capital, which is a venture capital fund investing in Africa-based technology companies. Listen, Maya inspires me because she just has guts. (laughs) She just has balls. Like she moved to Nigeria and is doing all these amazing things. Um, And you hear, you'll get to hear um, a lot of what she's been able to accomplish in such a short time um, in the course of our interview. But one of the things that really stuck out to me when we recorded this last year was removing this notion that as African women, We set goals and we have to struggle to get there, that it always has to be hard. Um, And it made me really think about it a lot. And one of my watchwords for this year is ease. I don't want to have to struggle for every single project or every single deal or every single goal. I just want ease. Ease. (laughs) That is one of my watchwords. I want to attract the things that I'm um looking for while I'm working towards them. Um, but yeah, it doesn't always have to be difficult. So I can't wait for you to listen to this. I hope it inspires you as much as it inspired me. Enjoy. Hi Maya. Hello. I'm so excited that we're finally getting to do this because we've been trying to do it for a while. Yes, long time coming and I'm excited as well. Thank you for having me. <laughs> um so I've already done like a really like a mini introduction, but I wanted to kind of start out like talking about how we met and (laughs) and basically talk about your journey and share some of your financial tips with my audience. Um, So I think we met when we were both speaking on a panel for International Women's Day. And I just thought, oh, my God, like she's so brilliant. And when I was thinking about um, this podcast and the kind of women that I wanted to be on the podcast I was like I definitely have to get her on and wow thank you the feeling is certainly mutual (laughs) yeah you've done so many big things um this year especially so do you want to talk a little bit about that what were your highlights sure sure so this year a lot has happened for ingressive family of businesses in general and then just I'll give some background as far as what we've been doing and then what the culmination has been. And so um, in 2014, I launched an advisory firm that assisted global VCs and technology businesses to enter and operate across sub-Saharan Africa. We've worked with more than 50 clients ranging from Y Combinator to uh, Google for developers and Facebook blockchain and GitHub and Figma, et cetera, et cetera, assisting them with a multitude of, of services. And then in 2017, with some of our clients, we launched Ingressive Capital, which at the time we were raising a $5 million VC fund, but then that grew into a $10 million VC fund that we closed in 2019. 
And then uh, this year, so then that's sort of the background. This year in 2020, we decided to launch Ingressive for Good, which is a nonprofit that provides micro scholarships, technical skills development, and talent placement for African youth. And what that means is we sponsor computer science degrees at, at top tier universities across Africa. We buy um, young people laptops and data who want to learn how to be in tech. We pay for their online Coursera and like higher education courses, et cetera. And um, we did this because one, we wanted to be able to increase the, um, the pipeline of, of high quality companies. If you increase those who are learning tech, then inevitably a percentage of those will become entrepreneurs yeah. and also increase the viable technical talent. Cause you know, we invest in companies and they're always hiring. Where are they going to source talent from if nobody's, you know, investing in building up technical skills on the continent. And also like our fundamental belief for the, for the organization, like all of the companies, you know, my very core fundamental belief is, you know, our fundamental goal is we're, we're trying to ensure that every brilliant African, regardless of where they're based, regardless of their background, has the resources they need to build wildly scalable businesses. So this, all of these initiatives and all of our work is dedicated to ensure that we're sort of democratizing access to technology and to entrepreneurship that everyone, no matter who you are, who you know, who your family knows, mm -hmm. you can start. That's amazing. So tell, let's talk a little bit about how you started. So you've done all these amazing things, but you didn't grow up in Nigeria. You came here at a relatively young age to start this, you know, huge business. So can you tell us a little bit about that process? like starting out. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And then I'll, I'll finish. You'd asked about some of the other 2020 successes and I didn't mention anything about Paystack <laughs> or, or no, we'll our plans there. for our next fund. So I'll, we can talk about all that later. But in yeah. any case, yeah, starting out the organization, you know, I started my first company when I was 23 with about a year of professional experience. And um, so like I went to Pomona College undergrad, Cornell Free Law, worked at JP Morgan and in private equity research. And then what I really tried is in 2014, I, I, I tried to just launch a, a VC fund. I was like, yo, that <laughs> is the thing in Africa. I at me 23. Million bucks. Yeah. And that is uh, such a big audacious goal. <laughs> Yeah. And unfortunately, at the time, investors uh, were like, who are you and what's your experience? Small girl. No. <laughs> um, and so instead, you know, I was like, OK, I'm, I'm building this advisory firm and I'll, sh I'll take you to Nigeria and I'll show you the high quality investment opportunities. And that was a more digestible sort of first step that eventually led to them giving money anyway. Um, but would you say that basically like you, you took your rejection and then you saw, OK, I'm not going to take it personally but I'm going to figure yeah. out where the opportunity is. Totally, is totally. And, and I think women in general and young people in general can be like, oh, I can't do this because I'm young or I can't do this because mm. I'm women. It's never a no. It's always a how. Like mm. you haven't, that means if you get a no, that means you haven't found the, found the right door. You haven't found the right path. Like me starting out, like my dad is, you know, I, I help out my family here. I, I'm not from a rich Nigerian family. And, and my mom in the US, like, I grew up in a trailer park, like really poor. And my mom was in the military. And like, so on both sides, there was like struggle. And I had no connections when I first moved to Nigeria. Like literally I was going from meeting to meeting on KK, just like depending <laughs> on people to be generous and open their contacts and open their books to connect. So like, there's no, the idea of like, oh, you have to, you know, you have to, to be connected. Someone. You have to come from a successful background. Yeah. You have to know someone that's totally false. And, and the benefit of technology and, and actually the benefit of COVID and technology um, means that we all have access to these digital tools. Everyone is literally one LinkedIn message away, one tw tweet away, one, you know, Instagram DM away. And that's really how I built my network. It's not because I knew anyone. It's because I had the aud audacity to say, you know, I don't know you, but I have this big, hairy, scary goal. And I, I'm a hundred percent convicted with every ounce of my being that it's going to succeed. Do you want to join me or not? And those were, the, you know, of course, like more, more candor and more polite, but like, um, just like being very committed and, con and uh, to my end goal. And then also offering things to, cause sometimes people will, you know, reach out to me and say, Hey, I want this kid. Can you give me this to me now? And it's like, well, you know, people don't realize sometimes when you're first starting out and you have nothing to offer you, you, or you, you, you know, it's not a tangent, it's not a, a peer to peer relationship. You're not reaching yeah. out to your equal. There's somebody who's a, achieved more than you and you want to, you know, get a, get assistance or funding or what have you from them. 
you can still access those people and message those people, but come with an offer as in like, Hey, I saw, I, I know you're really into this. And I saw this article. I thought you'd be interested in it. Yeah. Now do you have, you know, do you have 15 minutes to have a quick conversation with me about X, Y, and Z or like, Hey, I know you invest in this space and then, and you invested in this company, which is similar to ours, but we do this and this is how we're differentiated. Would you like to sit down with me and learn more about my business? Like, doing the research and, and coming with an offer and then actually caring about the humanity of the person. Like at the end of the day, it's all about trust building and it's all about yeah. personal relationships. And so like nice people, compassionate people win because like, if you like whoever you are, like that's how, you, that's how you break down the barriers. That's how you get into the door is by building like trusting relationships where, where people, where people will be your ally and advocate at every level of the organization is, or, or whatever, wherever you are at every level as you're, as you're transcending and excelling. So that's, that's sort of like a, a few tips from my side. And the, and the last thing was when I first started out, um, I really made no traction the first maybe year and a half of business. And, mm -hmm. um, that's because I really wasn't working on myself. And so I kept finding myself, you know, attrition was really high. We weren't keeping, nobody wanted to work with mm -hmm. us. Like and we couldn't close any deals. We were like, I was fundraising, but nobody want like no, no tickets were closing. And, and I found that um, I actually had to turn into myself and do the spiritual work, do the emotional work, do the mental work to sort of get past some of my traumas or, you know, biases or like lack of compassion for other people. And that could, that really inevitably, I, I worked on myself for a few months and that, and then immediately, like it was like clockwork. And I also worked on my subconscious, like what I truly believed I could do and I deserved yeah. and all those things. And um, I like literally... The transition was overnight. I closed, you know, my first hundred thousand dollar investment. We closed our made our first major ten clients. We, you know, picked up people who were, you know, committed and excited to the organization, stayed with us, et cetera, et cetera. And it just before, built on from there. Before but. we go to sorry, before we go mm -hmm. to like the money side of it, I really want to talk about what you just said about working on yourself and doing um the inner work. Do you feel like it was a combination of doing the work? And, you know, managing maybe like your negative emotions and how you f felt about, you know, um, rejection and a function of time as well. Because obviously you'd been doing the work for a year and especially all over the world, these deals take time. But I feel like in Nigeria, things tend to take a little bit longer. So do you think it was a function of also being patient through the process and figuring out, okay, what can I change? What can I do in the meantime? No, I would say it's exactly the opposite. Um, I, th I think the, the problem with Nigeria is people's compliance and like acceptance of this slow pace of doing things and like the paper pushing back and forth months to get an answer to blah, blah, blah. No, like with us and with our team with, and with me personally, everything is so laser focused on KPIs, objectives, execution. I don't care about the time you spend. I don't care about you. Like I tried to do this, but I couldn't because of X, Y, Z, you either do it or you don't. <laughs> and so, and, and again, that's like, if you're not succeeding, you, you're not finding the right path. That's the wrong door to be knocking on. And like mm -hmm. that, if I had accepted like, oh, it just takes a while, the economy, blah, 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 as opposed to being so persistent that people could not say no, because they'd be like, this girl's going to harass me. I, like, <laughs> I can't sleep. I get an email every day, you know? Um, Do you know, it's um, so and, interesting because I generally, I genuinely, right, feel like I'm a very, I'm a naturally aggressive person. And mm -hmm one of my superpowers is that I'm resilient, I'm persistent. Mm -hmm. But even for me, like at some point it gets really tiring when you're having the same conversation for eight months. And I don't know what the answer to this is, but I'm sort of getting to the point where I'm like, you know what, does it always have to be a struggle or do you just need to like lean into the process? Uh, yeah, no, I, I really don't think it always has to be a struggle. You know, my first few years, I've ever, every deal closing was a struggle because I was pursuing people that were not my immediate clients. So it took information, it took time, it took convincing, cajoling, getting, you know, convincing their personal. Now I realize like I can have one conversation and if, if somebody's serious and, and if they're within my total addressable market, they are my target customer. Cause that's the other thing as well as when I first started out, everyone was my customer. 
Mm. And so like, I wanted to sell to everyone. And of course that's going to take so much longer. And of course you're going to have so much more stress and face so much more no's because you don't spend the time on the front end. I didn't spend the time on the front end sourcing down to what is the key profile of somebody who actually is ready to commit funds to investing in Africa or who's ready to expand their business. Every single person I met, you could be like, I, I could be pitching to you, you know, and maybe you said no today and I'd still pursue the conversation for another six months. Like that's, that's a dead lead. And that's not, well, I don't, it's not a dead lead because I'm sure you would invest if I asked, <laughs> but, <laughs> but like in, 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 in general, like, um, just it, it's, it saved that, that loss of morale to spend your time researching and figuring out who are the people who can move who are the people that are relevant in this space and who specifically is my customer? Like, who do I want to engage in? Who am I selling to now? Um, and also, so, so, cause uh, you know, we all function on that sort of like dopamine release that happens when you close a deal. Like, yeah. like we all, we all need that to keep going. And so it's very important. You have your big, hairy, scary clients say you're, you know, pitching to a big corporation and it does take a long time, but mm -hmm. then you also have your smaller, you know, the, the quick wins that you can get with say, you know, local organizations or partnerships or activations or something like whatever space that you're that in. That help you keep so there should be Exactly, exactly. And of course, those big corporates are, or those big, you know, long-term clients, government, whatever you're trying to close the transaction with, they also want to see your ability to execute and so you'll have to have a portfolio. So it, it, it is the best to have that two-sided approach of, you know, same with us. Like when, when I launched the fund, if I was only pursuing institutional investors and like sovereign wealth funds and fund of funds, I'd still be pitching today and have never closed a dollar in my life, honestly. Um, and what, what happened was I started out raising or accepting funds from smaller ticket investors, but who I had built a personal relationship. It typically always starts with friends and family. And mm -hmm. like they, you know, the ticket small sizes were smaller. They were investing maybe 50, 100, 150,000. And slowly that built over time. And then I use that money to make investments, start building my traction, start building my reputation. And then a year or two years later, those big institutions like sovereign entities, fund of funds, et cetera, were like, hey, you have great companies in your portfolio. Not only that, you have traction. We see your ability to, to deploy capital, blah, blah, blah. And so I would say like it's it, it's okay to start to start small and, and close on those quick wins that you specifically define the people that want to to work with you like when i first started out i pitched to a guy and he and then he you know he was actually my first investor and i pitched to him and or he had reached out to me initially and i pitched to him and then he was like great i want to invest like let's let, let me write a check and i was like <laughs> what it can't be that easy like, like are you no serious? no no i need yeah. I was like, no, no, no. I need to prove more. Like, no, I need to No, Like let go find the easy one. Said yes. Stop fighting. Not everything has to be, we, we, as women, as Africans, as, as, you know, as entrepreneurs on this, as emerging market entrepreneurs, we need to change the narrative belief and the belief that like every win has to come with pain and every win has to come mm. with like suffering. It's okay to just win. Yes. The right way with integrity, with integrity, doing things above law, et cetera, et cetera. But it's okay to just, you know, find like to find your flow, to pursue what's easiest. Like it, it's not a sustainable practice and it's also not high growth. You haven't hit product market fit. If every cell is a push pull drama, da, 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 da. Mm. Like you have, you have figured out your right flow. If you have one conversation, the deal's closed. You have one conversation, the deal's closed, et cetera. Like that's where we should all aspire to be and thus focus on our target market and spend the time on the front end researching the type of people, the type of clients, the type of investors, et cetera, that are right for us. So more, so we have more frequent hits, if that makes sense. You know, sense. I love this. I feel like I need, needed this conversation more than even my audience because, <laughs> because I've definitely been feeling like really stuck these days. Um, mm -hmm. and, but I do want to say, I love this approach that you've put out, but I do want to say for different, um, business models you have to expect that sometimes it's going to be like difficult and that's okay as well but I think mm -hmm. it's definitely a very important point like to put it out there that the wins don't always have to come with struggle because mm -hmm. I laughed when you said that because I was like oh my goodness every time I get a quick win I don't trust it yes I always yes. think because my mind is like programmed to think if it's not hard then it's not going to work out, which mm. isn't healthy. Yeah. And you so. attract what you believe. Like I mm. so strongly believe in the power of the subconscious, like whatever your target is, whatever your target is, that's what you inherently and innately go towards. 
And also that's what the, 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 the type of energy you attract to yourself. So literally if you spend the time reprogramming, like my wins are seamless, my wins are seamless. You repeat that to yourself every morning. Every like you'd be surprised how it changes your, yeah, yes. Yeah. That's amazing. I'm a big affirmations person. <laughs> I love it. Um, so what, what would you say your biggest challenges, you know, with building, you know, a business like this in Africa? Um, I would say it was the human capital component, which was a reflection of me working on myself again, what I mentioned before, like the, the problem with attrition that we had, like we've now all of our, all of our team members, we have zero attrition. We've had all like, everyone is like, we have like one new person, everyone else is over three years with the organization. And tangibly, like within business, I, I realized that also, when you hire people, you need to lay out really, really clear objectives. And so we do, we do, this is how we hire everyone, three month trial period, where we have preset KPIs for that three month period, you, you like, as in, hey, in three months, this is what I want the organization to look like due to your uh, work, or in three months, this is what I want these specific metrics to look like from your, from your involvement, you figure out how to do it. We're here to provide the resources if you need, but go, go forth. And you said, you know how to, you know, for example, you said, you know how to increase followership on social media or like lead, lead brands and campaigns, or you said, you know how to do um, operations, like come up with your plan, build out a, a strategy and you have three months to execute at the end. You've, if you've achieved, achieved everything that we mutually agreed, you get the full-time role and, and increase in salary. If you don't, there's no questions, you know, you failed. I know you failed. We don't even have to talk about it. <laughs> and so being one, being really clear on the front end with exactly what you expect of the person who's working there, like, like, Hey, you need to do, you know, we, you need to have, uh, saved us 20% uh, in or increased our margins by 20%. You need to have s reduced expenses by, you know, 15%. You need to build like very, very clear quantifiable goals um, on the front end that you guys both agree to, as well as, you know, your, the, the monthly, quarterly and annual KPIs. I didn't invest in that. And so it was like, I just had people and I was like, you didn't do the thing that I want done because <laughs> The company's still the same, but they're like, well, what do you even want done? And so, yeah, one, getting really clear on the front end with goals. Um, two, sourcing for skill or for people who are, you, you can either, there are two types of hires that you that you can and should make in an organization. Um, one is somebody who's deeply experienced in the sector and like knows it like the back of their hand. So it's literally just a copy and paste. You're like unplugging one, putting it in, in a new outlet and they continue doing what they've done before. That's quite interesting because in Nigeria, I find that as an employer, you sometimes have to make you know concessions for certain things because on paper you might need a certain skill set but you interview and interview and interview and no one quite like hits you know this specific skill set that you're looking for and sometimes you have to make you know a decision like do you do you want people that are inexperienced and have like the best attitude or do you want people who are like highly skilled um highly skilled um but don't have the best sort of like work ethic or or attitude um when it comes to like your business and the vision that you have for your business do you ever have to make those sort of um decisions i think you know at the beginning i definitely had to sort of like take what i could get because we couldn't pay anything close to market rate we really didn't have any money and it was just ideas but at that at the beginning you also like if uh, the way I look at it is twofold. Either I'm compensating with equity, and so I'm looking for people who have aligned visions and are super talented and potentially like co-founder material. And as such, they should be really competent. Flow with culture. We should. We have to get along. It's you know, mm -hmm. co-founders become are essentially the same as married. Yeah. Um, and so uh, core core highly skilled people on on the front end who are buying into the equity and the vision, and that's why they stay committed to the organization. Or later on. When I do have the salary, um, I, I, I'm, I'm just very specific about exactly what, what it, the person has to do. And we source from like alternative, alternative organizations. I find that, I mean, I'm biased, but I find that people just generally within the tech community who are, were like operators at technology companies or engineers or designers at technology companies, they, they think in a certain way and they're really focused on getting stuff done. And yeah. so like, I'm pretty... I like hiring from within the tech community. Um, <laughs> I, I, I think generally culturally, like we're also, 
it, it, with, uh, within our organization, we are very relaxed. Like you can wear whatever you want. You can work from home or work from the office. Um, but you just have your, your core set of deliverables, your stuff that you have to get done. Like, yeah. Hey, you know, you, you have to make this many posts. You have to write this many articles. You have to, you know, X, Y, and Z. And those are your responsibilities. And as long as you keep doing that, the organization succeeds and grows. And of course, you know, they increase every month. Um, and if you don't do that, then you don't have a job. And like, so there's incredible flexibility with how you get the things done. Like it's totally your responsibility, but at the end of the day, you still have to get it. And so no, because of how, because of our structure and how sort of off, off hands we are and, mm. and sort of the, op the opposite of micromanaging, like we don't manage, like you, you have to be a self-starter and like essentially an entrepreneur in your own role because of, of an organization like that. We won, everyone has to share the same value and passion. Like you, everyone has to be passionate about you know, building the next generation of, of African innovators and like, you know, promoting the youth and helping them get, get skills and, and access ownership and, you know, and have, and have finance and, and, and make money. Like they, we all have to be equally passionate about the same thing because that's what drives people to give their best and to, you know, really commit in their heart to the role. And so, yeah, that's the other thing. When I'm doing interviews, I always want to understand the, the person's deep motivations. Do, yeah. they, do they just want a job? Me. Yeah. Or is this like, is this, is it, are they willing to stay up till 3am on a Tuesday every week because they love this so much and it, and it validates something deep within them to be within the space. And those are the type of people that we, we want to work with. And yeah, also, cause we're so hands off. I just need people that get stuff done. Don't really, you know, don't have a lot of entirely. Yeah. Yeah. And I find that you, you might be a little bit lucky because the tech community here, I feel like people, Lo loads of them were self-starters because if you went to school in Nigeria, mm -hmm. for example, I feel like all that technology stuff, you had to teach it to yourself mostly. Totally. So a person who has gone out of their way to like learn certain skills just so that they can excel in an industry is probably going to do better than someone who just like took the Nigerian education that they were given and, you know, didn't really do anything to improve their skill sets because I feel like one of the biggest issues that we have in Africa right now is labor like skilled labor mm -hmm. so people mm -hmm. have mm -hmm. degrees and certificates but not necessarily um they don't necessarily bring value because they don't know how to know how to apply the knowledge so mm -hmm. it might be interesting to look in the tech sector um yeah. When I'm I, I mean, <laughs> I strongly, I strongly recommend it. Yeah. <laughs> um, so let's shift gears a little bit. We've been talking about challenges and all of that. I want to talk about some of your very heavy wins in 2020. <laughs> <laughs> um, I believe you started the year out, like you raised $10 million and then one of your first, um, investments or one of your first portfolio companies um mm -hmm. sold to stripe for 200 million dollars yeah over 200 million dollars wow. Yeah. wow 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 um so do you want to talk to us a little bit about that how did sure you um yeah so paystack was our very first investment our very first fund investment back in 2017 and we backed them because um, we really believed in Shola and Ezra as a co-founding set. They have very complementary skills. They have background in the space and they were just very humble people who were incredibly focused on the customer. No, like, you know, no, nothing other than very quiet, observant, fo customer focused and, and, and competent, very skilled in the technology space. And so those are all sort of like key skills for successful founders. And, um, and they were also focused on not only was it a deeply entrenched problem that, you know, millions of us faced on the continent, um, but it had the potential to become a, you know, billion dollar plus business. And so um, like given the market size, even in Nigeria alone. And so uh, we decided to invest in them in 2017. And um, I had just raised my very first LP investment, limited partner. So the very first money from the very first investor who committed in me had just made a commitment. Wow. And I was just like, don't even send me the money, send it straight to Paystack account. <laughs> um, so they were your so, first, first, first risk. Yes. Yes. Very, very, I have a few very, questions very about that. Mm -hmm. So first, did they approach you or did you approach them? Like, was it a situation where you saw this 
amazing company you were interested and in, you said, oh, I want to talk to them about raising capital or were they trying to raise capital and said, you know, can Ingressive put money in this? Well, at the time, Paystack was hot. Uh, in 2017, even back at the beginning, like when they participated in YC, they were a hot company. And so they were not short on um, investor Offers. interest. Yeah. Yeah. And so one, it was a combination of my, I had unique banking relationships and, and various like business opportunity relationships for them. Mm. Um, so it was a component of that as well as a component of, um, Shell is cool and he's a friend and like, you know, those, I think it, it, it's funny cause like you, you would never think this, but one of our, one of our differentiators as a, as a fund in Nigeria is that like, we're all also young entrepreneurs who are building our careers and, and we're all just really committed to, to helping founders. And I think when you come with that, like respect, oh, yeah. um, yeah, the respect, the respect of like, yo, I'm just here to help you out. Um, people open a lot more doors and, and, and when you come and you're just kind of compassionate and you care about their, their objectives and you mm. listen to them, that literally is a key differentiator here. And so think- just coming. Hmm? Yeah, I, I, it's so interesting that you say this because uh, my next question is going to be, do you think that in general in Nigeria, the, the private equity or venture capital, capitalist like um, approach is very, um, how do I say this in a nice way? <laughs> you don't have to say I will. Um, Predatory. I, like, yeah. Because I feel like there's with, so there's this thing in Nigeria where, the capital, right, feels predatory, like, and the founders themselves are often not sure how much control they want to give up because it's like, this is my blood, sweat, and tears. I want capital, but do I want to give up, you know, control of my business? And there often isn't enough conversation around finding a fit, you know, like you said, with people who can not just offer you money, but technical expertise, um, strategic partnerships, um, and are genuinely invested in not taking away your business, but invested in growing your business, like helping you grow your business. Mm -hmm. Do you think that this is, um, that that's what differentiates you because they're more VCs or more PEs that are predatory or have that take, 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 take mentality in Nigeria? Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't want to talk. I, I don't know. Cause I don't work with them. Um, and I'm not in the PE space at, at all. So just for mm-hmm. listeners, the difference private equity is like the larger transactions, like series C series, like hun- raising hundreds of millions, you know, billions of dollars, like heavy, typically infrastructure and like non-tech business. Uh, space is where PE is most active on the continent. We're very early stage, hundred $100,000 to like $500,000 tickets into very early stage companies exclusively within the tech space. So just in general, um, from the VC to PE, as well as like the online to offline, I don't really interact with the traditional PE players that, that you'd probably be familiar with. So I don't really, I probably know as much as you do. Um, and, but I, I do know that, you know, on the continent, and in Nigeria, I'll, I'll talk about specifically, Nigerians have really built their wealth in agriculture, real estate, you know, energy, these really tangible and physical assets, e- even the techie telecommunications, which is, you know, afforded a lot of wealth for, for people here. Um, that really is, is in it like towers and infrastructure and like another physical and tangible play. And then when you're talking, and then also the people who start those businesses, and if you look at the executives, the chairman and the CEOs and the founders, you don't see a lot of 20-somethings. Like, I, I don't know that I really ever have, unless somebody's inheriting the business from their parents. Mm. Um, and so it's an incredible m- minority to see not only a young person, but also somebody building something that's intangible. And as such, I think there's a, there's a, there's a, a defensive nature about, unsophisticated Nigerian investors who come being like, well, you know, like, cause there is, this is a, there is question of trust in a society. Yeah. And so, um, yeah. 
Yeah, on both sides. And so when you already come with that mistrust of like, well, I can't see their business, so how can I verify like, oh, da, da, you know, and then mm. you want to have control and ownership because typically in, in, in like if I, own an, if I own an oil block, it's a zero sum game. Either, either, yeah. either I own the oil block or you own the oil block. But in tech, we can both win and we can build technology that builds on top of each other. My API inter integrates with this platform, which was built by this, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And so I think it just requires a, a total shift in a lot of the um, beliefs and a lot of the business practices at large of those traditional industry players. And people can learn for sure. Yeah. Um, but, but as such, if, if an unsophisticated investor and somebody who doesn't know about tech is coming into the tech space, trying to practice with the same business principles as oh, those wow. traditional spaces, it won't work. And that's where I think you're seeing some of the sort of like predatory terms and um, just like contentious relationships and where it feels like, hey, we're not aligned is because that's, the, that's what's happening. The approach, yeah. Um, and I think to be fair to, I guess, investors in Nigeria, sophisticated or not, there's always issues around if I give this founder my money and they go and play around with their idea and there are no like real controls in place, then I've just... Mm -hmm. I might as well have like pissed it away. So I kind of um, get it, but I think it's so important what you've done <laughs> because I think that this, more than the amount um, that um, Paystack was able to sell for, is historic and it gives hope to young people because we're living in an era where young, many young people are not necessarily seeing like a way out or a way to you know, build wealth or to succeed. They're not seeing a clear path. Everything in Nigeria generally seems like obstacle, obstacle, obstacle. Um, mm -hmm. And then you see people who seem to, there are lots of people who seem to be thriving um, based off of doing, you know, funny things like Yahoo or, you know, being a Ron's girl. And I can see how if you look on Instagram, and this is something I kind of worry about now, like young kids, like looking up to people and looking at their roadmap and thinking, well, why should I work hard when this person who is doing something dodgy is flossing on Instagram? If that is the path um, that will get me there quicker, why don't I go down that path? Um, but I feel like this is historic because it shows mm -hmm. young people that there's something you can build things you can work hard you can't you don't have to be anyone's child or know anyone or sleep with anyone you know to mm -hmm. get mm -hmm. you know um an opportunity uh, to hit it big so i feel like it's such it's such a hope and faith building um thing even more than the transaction you know itself mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. did you have any i absolutely agree did you have any um because there was an argument. It was so funny when the Paystack thing came out. I feel like a few weeks ago, I'd been seeing um, an argument on social media around, oh, these fintech companies, the reason that the banks are not sort of like buying them out or buying um, or s creating strategic partnerships with them is because they feel like they're their valuations are or they're overvalued right and you mm -hmm. know what's the proof what's the market and then the pay stack thing comes out and it's like it's like wow. that's it right there yeah wow. i think it's been incredibly it, it will prove to be incredibly transformative not simply because it's it's validating the liquidity abilities of african founders um and and tech on the continent at large so like i'm even getting because of that i mean one in part because we're an investor but now because there's more investor like institutional investor awareness like mm -hmm. the, the 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 global capital is now looking at africa being like oh we've just you know this is the end of the investment process you invest in something yeah. you wait and then you sell it for a lot more great it just mm -hmm. happened you know um so that but then also the guys like Shola and Ezra are indigenously educated. They work local at, you know, African firms. They're, they're, um, they're from, you know, Nigerian families. And, and I think it's really, yeah, important as you, as you, as you've mentioned to show that you really can win just working very hard and being honest and work and, and a person of integrity. They didn't get into YC cause they knew this guy and had this yeah. connection, you know, like <laughs> they got into YC um, they the because they worked really hard and they, they didn't get in the first time. They had to pl apply multiple times, try again, try again, try again. That resilience, that grit, that determination, no ego. Like some people be like, ah, 
I don't want to go to that one anyway. They don't, they don't know what's good for that. They you know, know anyway. No. So, yeah. yeah. Not for people like mm-hmm. us. And then, mm-hmm. you know. But did you ever worry that um, banks would become a huge pro- competitor for Paystack because they started to no. create their own payment platform? No. Um, I mean, like, if you see the quality of the technology solutions of the banks, it's probably going to be a long time before um, anything really is competing with the technology space. I'd say it's their best, in their best interest. I love that. I, love that. I mean, I'm, uh, you know, um, and then also I just, I think there are so many inefficiencies within the financial services space. You like the, the, there's, there's a lot of room. There's a lot of room for improvement. People are always like, Oh, you know, this, this company's building, targeting the, you know, SME space that's totally offline to the banking industry. But what if banks start, or start targeting the space? It's like, they haven't, I don't know that, you know, so, and yeah, so long story short, I, and also, um, the technology, just, just the technology second to none. Yeah. I'll just, no, I'll, leave I'll leave it there. <laughs> the faith, the faith that you had, you know, in the company. Yes, it was a hot company at the time, but I can see how, like, early on, when they were pitching this idea to people, they would be like, uh, no, this is not sustainable because banks are going to come and buy you out or banks are going to just replicate it for cheaper. But you've proved all that, you know, wrong. So uh, it's going to be very, very interesting times seeing how. Um, big institutions deal with these sort of opportunities um, going forward. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Now that their assumptions are not um, proved. The next thing I was going to ask was, can we talk a little bit about your personal finances? Sure, absolutely. Any um, strengths or strategies that you'd like to share? So what did you do with your first paycheck? Uh, <laughs> my very first paycheck, I worked at, in wireless at, um, Best Buy Mobile, which is like a, a wireless retailer in the U S I was a wireless expert. So I helped people fix their phones. Um, and that, that was my first, I believe that was my first job and first paycheck, like formal paycheck. Um, I really like when I first started making money, cause I had no guidance or, or advice or anything on, on personal savings or money management or wealth creation from anyone in my family. I was just like, Oh, I got this. Let me blow it. You know? <laughs> and so, um, I can't even remember what I, what I spent it on, but I can say that my first, like my first 10 years of money making, I blew everything and had no concept of saving and, um, and anything like that. So, um, only, you know, only in recent years as I started, you know, thinking about my future and uh, my future family and the legacy that I want to leave, like not only with the organization building a massive venture capital firm across Africa, but like me, like I'm managing, you know, millions of dollars of other people's money, but what do I, what do I have for myself? What, what's my right. nest egg? Like, what am I going to be investing in? And so everyone gets to that point because, you know, when you're young, yeah. You're like, oh, I, I need to get a good job so I can earn good money or I need to start a business so I can earn good money. And then you start making it. You get to a point where you're like, wait, hold on. I'm building my company or I'm building my um, a corporate's company. But what am I doing to build my own you know, net worth? I think it's okay for us mm-hmm. to not beat ourselves up about it. In Nigeria, they say when you wake up is your morning. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Oh, I love that. I really love that. When you wake up is your morning. So whenever it starts, mm-hmm. you know, or whenever you figure it out, like you start doing what you need to do. So mm-hmm. how did you make your first 1 million Naira? Probably there, you know, it was over a number of months, nothing sexy, just, you know, hustling away, working at uh, Best Buy. I mean, wh- where did I, where did I make enough money to, to have a million Naira in my account is a different story, mm-hmm. but but like, like when, when I learned to stop spending and start budgeting and start paying attention to exactly how much I'm spending on everything every month and tracking every one of my expenses, which is something I do now that gives me a lot of independence and oversight and I can plan for things and I can also pay attention when I'm like, like it, you know, you don't realize how much the emotion is tied to your finances. Mm-hmm. Like this much I'm spending a lot. Oh, because I'm here or I went through this or this. Yeah, exactly. And so being able to even check yourself like, nah. I'm not going to punish my future self for like whatever I'm feeling in the moment. 
So um, that increased like self-control and just like, I guess, like um, bumpers, you know, training wheels for yourself to like help you navigate. Um, but my first million Naira, yeah, it was just as a, working at Best Buy as a wireless expert over months and months and months of, of you know, helping people and then getting promotions and getting bonuses for, you know, being the top salesperson and, and top person on my team. Um, that's fine. Amazing. So now that you got to that point where you're like, I know what my future, what I want for my future, and I don't want to continue like these uh, money habits, what would you say your investment strategy is now? Yeah. So I would say I'm dividing my portfolio. So I, I took um, Financial Peace University, which is a, it's by Dave Ramsey in the US. And it was really, really helpful. It's, it's one component, get out of debt. But if you don't have debt, like I, I didn't, I was fortunate. Um, I got a full ride academic scholarship to university. And so um, I graduated without any student debt or anything like that. And so um, mine was really just about, I, I joined the program to focus on, on wealth creation. And so the first part is you save a nest egg, um, for in case you get unemployed, you know, something that you put in treasury bills or like, yeah, yeah you'll low yield that is quickly, that can be quickly liquidated. So that like liquidity, either you hold it in cash in a, in a savings account that generates some interest, or you put it in the, in a, in a treasury bill where, um, you know, there's some security there. And there's some higher yield, but you know, you can get your money out the minute you need it. And mm -hmm. then so that I, cha I, I have like six months of, of salary that I put into that entity. And then I have my second sort of savings, savings goal after that in line with the Dave Ramsey program was, um, or is, um, I'd saved uh, enough for 20% home or down payment on a home. And um, that you can also just put in um, mm -hmm. treasury bills as you're saving or, or what have you. Um, but that was my second savings. And then my third is um, one for a commit, commitment to my significantly larger fund. So, so getting direct increased and direct exposure to venture capital. Um, and then I've been doing like maybe 5%. So I, I save, I try to save close to 50% of my, cause I have no liabilities right now. Mm. I have, you know, I have no kids, no, like everything's paid for. And so I try to save at least 50% of my monthly yeah. income. Yeah. Um, and, and I invest maybe like five, 5% 5 of that, um, into, uh, public equities in the technology sector, uh, mainly in the U S. So I'm getting a little, a little bit exposure to public markets and I'm really just tracking like, you know, I could put my money in a 401k or et cetera, et cetera. Like well, can't right now. I, yeah. Yeah. yeah I actually can't active. because I'm here in Nigeria, but yeah, also I'm, I can be more aggressive because I'm here and I'm, and, and, and young and I have that time. And also I can just track the things that they're investing in and then inv invest in the same companies, which is then I, I save the money on what I would otherwise pay to like a, a, a broker. Um, so yeah, I've just been doing, I've been sort of tracking, like my grandma works, you know, these gold, like any of these top money wealth management firms, like the Goldman's or the JP Morgan's or da da da. Yeah. Of course it's very complex and I'm, I'm, I, I in no way claim to be in any kind of expert at all. But my very, very basic um, strategy is um, investing in the top performing technology companies, the Microsoft's Apple, Google, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, as well as now the up and coming healthcare companies that are seeming to be leading the way in vaccine discovery. And so that's where I'm investing and we'll see, um, what happens in like 10 years. The, the idea with that is just to place and hold, oh, but as I continue, yeah. 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 Um, as I continue building wealth, it'll be real estate that and low risk treasury bills. <laughs> the treasury bills in Nigeria are already as low as no, no. No, not Nigeria. Actually, no. Forget treasury bills, given what's happening global globally. Gold and mm. silver. That's why I started looking I at I like the well. way you're thinking. I think that what I love the most about your investment philosophy is the fact that you recognize that you're young and it's okay to be aggressive at this stage because you don't have any um, obligations or dependents. Um, mm -hmm. So it's, I feel like you all, you'll get there faster than someone who is way too cautious um at this age um what would you say your first or what was your first childhood memory of money 
Hmm. That's an interesting question. I've never been asked before. Um, my first, huh? Like the one thing in your well, actually, you realize like, wow, money's important or money's not important. Uh, I would say so. I've always been kind of a hustler. You can ask my mom since I was like <laughs> in diapers. Um, and so, and my mom's Oimbo. She's white mm-hmm. and from America, and so the you know they're very nice to their kids in in the u.s so if i tell this story people here are gonna be like ah she did slap you you know (laughs) but uh but uh so i realized that there was some value associated with chores around the house like doing the dishes or picking up or vacuuming etc etc so then i literally just created a list of services that i could provide for the household and there was costs associated it was like you know five dollars for vacuuming the whole house $2 $2 for doing the dishes, um, you know, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> so, um, she could, she could, I could do all the chores, but then I would be compensated, which is the same as like getting a weekly allowance. And then, but I could increase the amount that I, I, I didn't have a cap on the amount of, um, on the allowance that I could get. So yeah, it. that worked out. I think that that's so cool because my daughter, like during like this pandemic stuff, she comes with like a notebook and she says, mommy, um, I've made a list of all the things I do for you and <laughs> I think this is how much you you should pay me. So she recommended prices for different like things. So when I take your plate to the kitchen, <laughs> I want 50 naira. When I <laughs> up your when I pick up if when you say mommy uh, oh sorry, when you say Zakora get me XYZ, I'm going to charge you this. So I think it's really <laughs> I think it's really interesting <laughs> and it's a very important sort of like thought process or learning um, curve for kids because it's important mm-hmm. to identify um, the fact that if I do something valuable, I can get paid for it. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. It's, a, it's an important skill for, ki- for young kids to have. So good on your mom. for ent- <laughs> um, So when it comes to spending what would you say your guilty pleasures are interestingly now given the covid i mean before covid hit and when i was still traveling because i I'm, I'm flown around the world for speaking engagements or i was and so like every month i'd be like at least once a month i'd be flown to a different continent like somewhere in asia somewhere in europe somewhere in you know the rest of the continent somewhere in the u.s to speak at an event um and so i would love to check out the duty free in you know random places around the world and find because like I don't do this anymore but (laughs) some of the uh, designer brands have exclusives for like Tokyo exclusive or like Paris exclusive or like Mm. Seoul South Korea exclusive and um, my guilty pleasure was in part because they are essentially collectors so I could in the in the event that I decided to sell them sell them at potentially a premium if I waited so I was considering the the interest the 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 potential appreciation of 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 my asset (laughs) Um, but yeah definitely um uh, rare designer products from different places traveling around the world. And the other thing is I love gifting one people. Of the most like I answers I've got. <laughs> <laughs> I love gifting people, like buying the people that I love things during my travels. Like I'm in, you know, Spain and I want to pick up this or I go to, you know, Italy and I want to get them truffle and, you know, spaghetti and da 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 all that kind of stuff. And so my whole year, I collect things from every, all my travels around the year. And then at Christmas time, I just give them out to everyone that I love. And But it's expensive. And especially, like, I had to bring two, like, checked bag suitcases the last time that I went to Minnesota um, to bring it from, to bring a, the stuff home for my family. And so I would say that's kind of a guilty pleasure because I get a lot of, it's literally my favorite activity to give you know people. That? I think it's so sweet and it's so important to have Um, pleasures that sort of like give you fulfillment as well and Mm -hmm. I like to say to people it's okay like you shouldn't even feel guilty wanting to do something like that but you might want to set um, limits like so yeah limits to say okay every year this is how much I'm going to spend um, on gifting you know people Mm -hmm. I think it's such a lovely um, gesture because you know Mm -hmm. he doesn't love gifts I think my favorite thing about giving gifts is 
seeing like the look on someone's face when they get something that they really wanted. Um, yeah. Yeah. It just, it, I feel or like. Or like it, never it, knew about. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so what would you say has been your biggest, you know, money failure or money mistake? Hmm. So throughout this journey, you've done so many amazing things. You've had so many wins. What would you say your biggest, you know, mistake? The one thing you wish you hadn't done or or maybe did and you've learned from? I would say, like, had I been serious about saving, because um, I, I worked at J.P. Morgan. I worked, you know, in, in banking in New York City. I worked in, you know, private equity research, et cetera, et cetera. If I had been serious about saving and during my time in college when I worked, during my time in high school when I worked, during my time, you know, after graduation, I could have had a more comfortable nest egg that I started from and potentially now, you know, in the 2008, 2009 housing crisis in the U.S., properties were like nothing. You could buy them for change, literally. And like the foreclosures, people were selling them like in in Detroit, you could buy houses for a dollar. and and um you know, I mean, then I was just getting out of high school and into college, but I had, I had started working. And, and if I had, if I could go back in time, the one thing that I would do was, would be save my money. And instead of buying shoes and bags and going on, you know, going here and there, um, I would have saved and bought property during the housing crisis. Cause the people who bought then, you know, they're, they're seeing like five X, 10 X on property value yeah. plus in a, in a matter of a few years, like barely a decade. Hindsight is always 50-50, but again, mm-hmm. when we wake up in the morning, um, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I love it. Um, if Final question. Mm-hmm. If you won the lot- lottery and you won a million dollars tax-free and it was all going to you, not aggressive, mm-hmm. um, what would you splurge on and what would you invest in? You know, I don't really get a lot of joy from splurging anymore. I really get in- joy from investing and building my own personal wealth. So I would go, it would immediately go into things that would be wealth building, um, probably exclusively. Um, there's not anything right now that I want materially that I don't have. Um, I'm, I'm fairly a minim- minimalist. Um, so I, I would likely buy real estate properties and invest in public equities and then use the remaining probably like 20% for like seeding some uh, companies or investing additional funds in my own venture capital firm. So going to a private island with your loved ones, your family, your friends um, on holiday is not going to be on a splurge list. No, and- no. <laughs> um thank you so much Maya I think that you've given so much insight into you know the world of investing in Nigeria and even your personal um philosophies when it comes to personal finances I'm so 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 thankful that you graced us with your presence on our podcast um where can we reach you where can people Instagram where you and I chat every day (laughs) um (laughs) Uh, Mayanator, M-A-Y-A-N-A-T-O-R, Mayanator. Okay. On Instagram. Ingress- DMs, I respond to 100% of them. Hmm? The Ingressive Instagram? Uh, Ingressive Cap, at Ingressive C-A-P. Amazing. Thank you so, so much. Have a lovely yes. day. Thank you, you too. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Smart Money Tribe podcast. I hope you enjoyed it. I'm super excited about creating financial content for African millennial women who want to live a fabulous life, but also want to learn how to find the balance between spending on their lifestyle needs and building assets that could protect their financial futures. 